Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Bob Britton, who is in the Dallas, Texas area. How are you doing, Bob? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Good. And, um, and Bob's been in sales, sales enablement, learning and development for more than 25 years and a Navy veteran. So thank you for your service. His military and corporate leadership uh, experience, along with his MBA, provide a unique and accurate perspective on current and future needs of our complex and rapidly changing business environment. Couldn't agree more. It is complex and rapidly changing. But what we want to talk about today is what is sales enablement and what it isn't. So, um, Bob, let's let's obviously baseline it with your definition of sales enablement, because we keep coming up with um, we love to come up with these new buzzwords and titles, you know, and all of this. And, you know, we can't and I just rev ops and there's all of this stuff. So when you talk about sales enablement, what do you mean? Sure. Well, first of all, sales enablement is one of those things where you ask 10 different companies, what are these, you get 13 different answers. Right. Exactly. Um, and it's usually defined based upon the problem du jour. Uh, that's, that's facing the company. So if there's uh, a hiring uh, evolution going on, it's going to be something around uh, maybe onboarding. If they're trying to get some sort of technology rolling, it might be sales operations. You know, so it really depends upon how they're defining it for the day. Um, I take a much broader view of it, and here's how I define sales enablement. It's looking for friction, which is impeding top-line revenue growth and fixing it. Mm-hmm. There you go. Simple, simple as. Um, so in terms of um, friction, Bob, what are the typical types of friction that we see that really impede sales? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, it, every organization is different. So there's nothing that you could actually say is common. Um, and friction also is not only within the, or- the selling organization, it's also heavily within the buying organization as well. So sales enablement, and I prefer to actually call it enablement rather than sales enablement, but it's one of those things like Xerox, it just kind of stuck. Yep. You know, so, uh, so sales enablement uh, and the places internally where it can come from, um, it, typically it comes from anywhere from the C-suite right on down to even facilities. You have a place to bring your people, especially these days, right, to actually have them uh, do a demonstration or to meet with them. Uh, IT is frequently uh, getting in the way sometimes, the the department of no oftentimes, right? Um, uh, Legal, oftentimes you'll have uh, sales that get hung up in legal and red lines. Uh, And and of course, in the sellers themselves. Uh, you know, are, are they, what's their, what's their development as far as their ability to actually sell? Um, are they actually having a conversation or are they trying to sell? One of the two, right? Uh, so you have to get them to the point where they're able to have a conversation. And, and of course, if the sales leadership also, there's, a, there's always some friction going on with the sales leadership. You have to fix that as well. Uh, marketing, of course, is another big spot for it. Um, so is there, uh, is that, everlasting chasm between sales and marketing still there or can we actually close that gap somehow right um, on the buyer's side it is amazing how often buyers infrequently have a defined buying process mm-hmm. um, and uh, trust me if we're having a hard time selling these days due to the current environment they're having just as hard a time buying so it's one of those things where uh, we keep looking at it from our own perspective, but we really need to take a look at it from the buyer's perspective as well and do whatever we can to ensure that the right message is getting to the right people at the right time. Yeah, I, I love that. That was very comprehensive, but I love the, the part that you just mentioned about the buying process, because we hear people all the time talking about, oh, you got to align with your buyer, with your buyer's buying process. And that's great. And it sounds great. And we all try to do that. But to your point, if your buyer doesn't have a buying process, or if they're just as, as you said, just as confused as you are, then you can't really align with that confusion or else you just get lots and lots of confusion. That's right. Um, but, but I guess that then it really puts the onus on you to really help, help your buyers, um, you know, help your buyers during this process and acknowledge the fact that maybe they're not as organized as you think they might be. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It does. You know, one of the most important things to remember about this is that usually when we're selling into a company, uh, our champion, the people we're selling to, are not sellers. Mm-hmm. Okay, the, the, themselves. We're not selling to salespeople. We're selling to budget holders, to technicians, to people that are project managers, that type of thing. Um, and what winds up happening is, I'm sure we've all played the telephone game where you know you, 
sit around in a circle and you tell the person to your right that my cat has fleas and by the time it comes around to you, it's my Volkswagen has a flat tire, yeah. something like that, right? So what winds up happening is the message that you're delivering to your champion, you have to expect that if you just do it a certain, do it the usual way, that message is not reaching the decision makers. You have to enable your champions to sell for you internally to carry the same message throughout the organization so everyone's on the same page. Otherwise, every single decision maker hears something different, usually what they want to hear rather than what the actual message is. Yeah, I know. I, I agree with you, Bob. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges for salespeople is literally what you just talked about. And that is equipping people in the buying organization to sell on your behalf or to communicate effectively on your behalf. And secondly, obviously, it's to open the doors for you. And again, that's that's another that's another part of the equation. Sure. Yeah. So um, today, when you say when people like say, oh, sales enablement, all you need is like oh, buy a sales enablement platform or, uh, you know, so this is, you know, we, we, we love to put all of these things in buckets like, oh, there's a technology solution for that. But technology doesn't solve process issues and doesn't right. um, solve friction points if you haven't identified them and figured out why they're friction points. So it seems to me that we've gone in the wrong direction a lot of times where it's always like, oh, let's lead with the technology solution. Yeah, absolutely. It, the thing to remember about technology is that it's a catalyst. It's not a solution. Um, mm -hmm. Let me back up one step here. If you look at where things are going with MarTech and sales tech, uh, just about all of it is geared toward top of the funnel activity. Yep. It's about how do you parse the market? How do you find them? How do you connect with them? How do you have the first meeting or two with them? There's hardly any technology out there that actually is helpful down toward the middle or end of the funnel. So it's it's only going to get you so far. And a matter of fact, sometimes it can work so well, it can create log jams. Uh, you know, a seller could potentially have a hundred meetings set up by you know some sort of technology, and they can only get to a dozen in any given week because they're so busy. You know, so that leaves a lot of people that had the meeting set up hanging, which could actually hurt your brand reputation. So, uh, so again, technology is a catalyst. And the thing about, uh, about a catalyst is it simply speeds up whatever was already there. So if your messaging is spot on and your ability to actually have conversations with people is spot on, technology will amplify that. Mm -hmm. But if it's poor, it's going to amplify that as well. And you're going to broadcast all of your warts to the rest of the world rapidly. You know, so it's a double-edged sword. It can be a boon so long as your basics are correct. But if the basics aren't correct, it's really going to hurt you. Yeah. And I think the the other, no, I couldn't agree more. And I think, yeah, when you use technology to enable things, if the things that you're enabling haven't been sorted out, you know, if you have terrible processes, you just get terrible autumn, you know, processes enabled by technology. That's right. Um, so here's another, here's another part. Uh, and, and I think this is, this is close to your heart is that at the essence of real sales enablement is the is is wanting to really connect to people, connect to clients as people, to be authentic, to build those proper relationships. And I think that certainly I think there was a there was a, a pendulum swinging back towards that even before the pandemic. But I think the pandemic has totally accelerated it. Mm -hmm. So I think that whole relationship building part, that whole authenticity, that whole treating people as people, the connecting part, I think that's become more important more important than ever maybe yeah i would agree with that and, and, and you're correct on the pendulum what, what's interesting about things right now is the biggest so the biggest thing is new normal what's the new normal going to look like going forward does mean that's when we hear that oh yeah i'm, I'm with you bob i swear to that is uh, if there's one phrase i never want to hear again it's that one <laughs> thank you uh so what's interesting is that uh you know the, the pendulum was already in motion before the pandemic toward uh, a higher degree of virtualization but the pandemic just slammed that pendulum right over to hard to the other side and um it's slowly starting to come back but what, you know what we have to understand about uh, the whole uh virtualization thing companies are getting punch drunk happy off of the bottom line efficiency that they're gaining out of this. But the top line revenue production isn't increasing at the same rate that the bottom line is, is actually improving. Yeah. 
So, and the reason why is because buyers themselves, while they might say, yeah, I like working without actually having to talk to a salesperson because who wants to talk to a salesperson? Uh, the fact is that also buyer's remorse is starting to creep in. Buyer confidence is starting to decline. Um, Gartner, as a matter of fact, just put out a report that said that there's a 23% increase in, uh, in, in buyer's remorse uh, as far as you know, their confidence in actually buying. So it, and that's all due to the fact that we don't have any kind of a face-to-face -face conversation. Um, you know, when I'm in a sales conversation with somebody face-to-face, -face, there's a tremendous amount of, you know, I'm looking at, at you right now, John, and I see you know, the, the, the three-quarter high. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what your hands are doing, what your feet are doing, what your body is doing. I have no idea. And there's a tremendous amount of information there that you can actually use. Um, the other thing is just simply the tone of the voice. You know, uh, And when you're in a room, if you have several people in front of you, you can tell who the leader is because everybody looks to that person. You can't do that when you're on a Brady Bunch screen. They, they don't look at each other to actually find out who the leader is. You don't know exactly who's going to be influencing the conversation. There is a tremendous amount of body language and psychology that goes into sales. Yeah. And a lot of that has been taken away by the virtualization. Yeah. If I remember the Brady Bunch correctly, didn't they look at each other in the different squares? Yeah, for TV they did, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they couldn't see each other. <laughs> yeah, I know they couldn't see each other, but it was funny. Yeah, maybe we should start doing that when we're in those Zoom blocks, like looking around. That would confuse people. Yeah, we're we're dating ourselves now, John. Careful. <laughs> hey, I'm I'm over that. I'm i I you know. Hey, I I grew up in pre-internet days. I'm you know. It's to my son, my 16 year old son. I'm a dinosaur from a different uh, era, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> Um, but it's great. It's a great point you you raised there. And I think the other thing I think that that uh, exacerbated that a little bit uh, was, Bob, was the fact that I think a lot of salespeople kind of came a little bit kicking, screaming to virtualization in the first place. Mm -hmm. Or if they were forced upon them during the pandemic, they thought, OK, I got to do this for a couple of weeks. Uh, and then it obviously it it extended out over a long period of time. So I think part of it is that some people didn't learn how to embrace it and use it properly. And therefore, yeah. if you're not going back face to face with people any anytime soon, or your company's decided that that's not the way to go, and, and you're, maybe your clients, that's not the way to go, you really do need to embrace this medium and make it work for you as, as best you can. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you do. Um, it, it's amazing how hard it is just to sometimes get people to turn their camera on. Yeah. You know, that, that so often uh, I'll hear the sales call or I'll sit in with our sellers. That is one nice thing about it. I can now listen to more sales calls without having to be on the road. Yeah. But, um, but aside from that, just getting the customer sometimes to turn on their camera so you can see their reaction is tough to do, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's also a lot that you can do to be interactive in this medium. Everything from whiteboarding to taking notes on screen so they can see what it is you're typing, um, letting them actually type into your own screen. Um, one of the big thing is um, if you're doing a demo, like a software demonstration, you can literally give control of that software to the person that's on the other side of you. You just simply say, give control. And you say, now do this, click here, here, and here, and they can do it and they de develop muscle memory. So rather than the seller traditionally driving the demonstration, now the, the client can drive the demonstration with their guidance. You know, so there's different ways to really embrace the technology and kind of meet the customer in the middle as to where they are, but it takes practice. And the one thing that I always tell my sellers is don't use the customer as a guinea pig. If you want to practice, practice on me or your sales leader or any, anyone else or your peers. Don't practice on the customer. And uh, so sometimes they take that to heart. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes no, you lead the I, horse to water, but you can't get them to drink all the time. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I guarantee you there, there are a large percentage of people who do practice on, on the client. Yeah. Um, because let's face it, we're not very good at practicing. You know, we'll practice our, we'll practice our hobbies, like our golf swing at the back for hours, but we won't practice like doing making zoom the best interaction it could possibly be <laughs> which one puts the bread on our table i don't know probably mm -hmm. the one that you're uh, not practicing <laughs> mm -hmm. probably <laughs> um so so um bob in the last couple of minutes here where do you see sales enablement going uh, because as i said i mean i keep seeing new things coming out all the time like this i i read when there was another acronym yesterday of some other sales related thing that i couldn't even get my head around but where do you see sales enablement going Sales enablement is uh, going to continue to grow. Um, right now, it's uh, sequestered 
frequently into more of a tactical role like program management. Mm -hmm. um, and it's slowly but surely beginning to be recognized as the strategic impact it can actually have. As complexity grows, uh, compl complications and complexities, as they increase in sales, um, that's what's driving the function, the growth of sales enablement right now at this point in time. Remember that enabling sellers is nothing new. Every company in existence enables their sellers, whether it's teaching them how to sell or giving them a computer or what have you. But sales enablement has only come around since, uh, I'd say the last 10, 15 years or so. And the reason why is because of that increase in complexity. And it's a function of wrangling that complexity that doesn't exist on most organizations. Um, if the best place to, suit, to kind of get yourself seated in an organization, if you're going to be doing sales enablement correctly, think of yourself as the, um, uh, the chief of staff for your chief revenue officer. Mm. Okay. Think of, think of it like that. You want to be the, the chief of staff for your CRO or CSO, whatever it is that you have. Um, you want to be their right-hand person to go out and actually pull things together for them to coordinate um, a little bit of a generalist, but at the same time also being able to direct and lead and do a little bit of program management. There's going to be a huge growth in that in this, in, in this industry because it's not going to get simpler. It's only going to get more complex. Yeah, and I think uh, that's a great. Thank you for that, Bob. And I think that's uh, there's great opportunity out there for people. So if you're looking at uh, if you're looking at doing the old Wayne Gretzky, uh, you know, skate to where you think the puck is going to be. Um, mm -hmm. Um, maybe you should start looking at the role that Bob just outlined there, because uh, that role will grow in importance. Those jobs will grow. It's a, it's a, it's an interesting role if you're that kind of person who likes being a kind of generalist and across a lot of different things. Um, you know, it sounds like a sounds like there'll be great opportunities. Uh, so listen, Bob, all of your information, all of Bob's information is going to be below the video so you can get in contact with Bob. But please, before you go, please tell people a little bit more about yourself and your organization. Uh, well, I, I wear several hats. Uh, uh, the, the first hat I have is uh, I'm director of sales enablement for a small cybersecurity firm called NetSurian. It's a great firm, great product. But uh, so I do that for them and, and I work closely with the sellers there. I also have a sales enablement consultancy. So I give advice uh, quite frequently to, to different organizations, show them how to do their sales enablement. And I'm also the uh, chapter president for the Dallas chapter president for the Sales Enablement Society. So those are the three hats that I wear. It keeps me pretty busy. And sales enablement is every one of those titles. So you can tell I have a passion for this. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Thanks, Bob. And the passion comes through. Uh, so thank you again for today. Thank you for those insights. My name is John Golden. I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Thanks.